thought, hey, you know, since it was supposed to be group launch Sunday and we're all tuning in today um, from our homes, I started asking what could it look like to create almost like a group atmosphere during the teaching? And uh, especially for those of you that are on Zoom groups and joining groups online, I think today could just be a cool picture of what it looks like to be in a group online, to be in relationship, to have genuine connection around the word of God. And so I'm going to invite some of my friends on. Some of them are currently in the group, uh, in a group with me. Um, a couple of them used to be in groups with me. Uh, but these are these are four guys that I just absolutely love dearly. And um, they're, they're not just names in my heart but they, they each carry a deep uh, 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 like admiration in my heart because of the opportunity to connect with them on a deep level. And here's what I know. Um, when we talk about groups, we say, don't do life alone. And I'm better because I know these four guys. And uh, here's what I know is right now, there are many of you that you can say the same thing, that that's your testimony. But we also recognize that there's many of you where maybe that isn't your testimony, that maybe the uh, maybe the deep yearning of your heart in this season is genuine connection, is genuine community. Maybe you've been hurt by relationships in the past and you've got walls up and it's actually a great fear of yours. Here's what I know is that wherever you're at today, God wants you to be surrounded. God doesn't want you to do life alone. We say this around here that we're better together and I'm better because these guys are with me today and uh, I'm just thankful that they're joining us in the chat today why don't we start with MJ how you feeling today man it's funny uh Ben Pastor Ben just asked me where my hat was because I did have a hat on for a minute because man it's cold oh come on you gotta rock that bro that's that's just the <laughs> look right there the, the goatee matches the fringe Mike oh that is the look man <laughs> that is just so fitting how about you, KB? I mean, come on, man. My guy's set up in his studio, just ready to go. How you feeling today, man? I feel great, man. You guys did an awesome job putting this together. So stoked to be here, man. I, I lost it in worship, just like I was sitting in the encounter, man. So just super proud of the team and grateful to be here today. I love it, man. I'm thankful that you're here too. And my heart was touched, man. I, I definitely shed a couple of tears and had a moment with Jesus. Sam, my hero, the guy that I look up to that I just can't wait until he opens his mouth in our small group every single week. Hello, somebody. How are you, buddy? Hey, dude, I'm doing awesome. I'm loving being at home. Had some pancakes and sausages and coffee this morning, um, and it's been an awesome morning. I love it, man. Well, we're grateful that you're here. And Jordan, I know that you've already had your moment, uh, but we're thankful that you're hanging around for the teaching portion and and uh, just excited to dive in here. And um, hey, I want to I want to do this. Um, as a matter of fact, if you we're not going to have the scripture on the screen because we're going to do something a little different to start here. So why don't you hey, if you guys got your Bibles, uh, why don't you hold them up right now? Um, wherever you're at, man, hold your Bible up right now. We're going to get into the word Matthew chapter six. Um, right now, if you don't have your Bible, run to your room quick and grab it so you can follow along with us or open your phone. Uh, you know, maybe hop on the Version Bible app. And uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter six. And uh, I'm excited to just literally dive straight into the word today. And uh, we're going to read this together and we're going to start uh, with MJ. He's going to kick us off. And uh, MJ, why don't you just uh, take us five through, I believe eight is what I said please. Yep. Yep. So in my Bible, it says the model prayer. So in Matthew 6, 5 says, and when you pray, you shall not be like hypocrites for they love and pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and when you have shut the door, pray to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, <laughs> for they think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your father knows the things you have for for the father knows the things you have need of before you ask him in this manner, therefore pray. And then it, it go, then it goes on to the our father. I love this because, and we're going to dive into this a little bit deeper, but it starts MJ with when you pray, 
I love that this is Jesus here, Sermon on the Mount, one of the most famous sections of scripture. And uh, we see pieces of this recorded in, in other gospels, but we don't see the totality of the Sermon on the Mount anywhere else in scripture. And again, just a reminder that it, it, this is Matthew writing and uh, Matthew's not quoted anywhere else in the Bible, but I love that he's the one that's penning this powerful sermon that honestly, I'm humbled to preach it today. I'm like, Jesus doesn't need me to preach it. Let's just read his word and obey it and walk it out. But I love here that he's he's making the assumption that his disciples will pray, that you and I would pray. If we're in Christ, we are disciples. This is Jesus on the side of a mountain addressing his disciples. But if you're in Christ, you're a disciple. And Jesus is giving us instruction on how to pray. And he he gives us a model here. And he he doesn't want us to just babble on through this or recite these words without connecting our heart to it. But Sam, could you maybe take us through this section, please? Yeah, I got verse nine picking up. Uh, Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins. And as we have forgiven those who sin against us and don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. This is such a great model. And today we're not going to dive super deep into this in terms of our practical application from today's message. But again, this becomes a great template for how you and I are to pray. And um, and I and I think for you, for those of you that are maybe new to prayer, that's the beautiful thing is um, there's something powerful about praying the word of God. You can just go through this verse by verse and allow each verse to spur on your own words, your own. And that's what I just want to free somebody with today is God's not looking for your eloquent words. He, he's looking for your heart to connect with him. And this becomes a great template for you and I to pray. Okay, KB, bring us home here, my guy. Yeah, you got it. 16 through 18 here. And when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do. For they try to look miserable and disheveled, so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that is that I tell you the truth that it is the only reward they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face, then no one will notice that you are fasting except your father, who knows what you do in private, and your father who sees everything will reward you. This is so good. You can see here that there's a there's a theme that's happening here, KB. Um, we see that Jesus is making the assumption that his disciples will pray and fast. It's not if, it's when. But he's also uh, teaching us how to do it. Because we know this, that oftentimes Jesus is more concerned why we're doing what we're doing than what we're doing. This whole Sermon on the Mount is revealing to us that Jesus cares about what's going on in our heart. And so if you're a note taker and you can even just write this in the chat, just fill it up so that I know you're, you're with me. But today's title is this, why am I seeking God? Why am I seeking God? And I'll tell you this. Um, uh, I've been just, uh, I've been asking this, this question to myself, why are you seeking God? OC? why? Are you seeking God? We see here that that Jesus is addressing these disciplines, and we, you know, the first part of Matthew chapter six, we see Jesus address the same thing with giving. So Jesus is is assuming that we will have the spiritual discipline of giving, of praying, and fasting, but he's getting to the issue of the heart. So let me pray, and then we're going to jump in here for just a few moments. God, thank you so much for just the opportunity to open your Word. Uh, we're so thankful uh, for this, this opportunity to ask this question. Why am I seeking God? Lord, I pray that today that we would be a people that this year we would find fulfillment in private pursuit, not public praise. That 
that what we do with you, that why we pursue you would come from a, a genuine place of, of knowing you. That, that God, we would yearn for connection, not clout. Lord, that, that, we would, that we would serve you for an audience of one, that we would seek you for an audience of one, that you would teach us what it looks like to hear from you in the secret place. God, I pray that as we open this word today, as we preach it, uh, that it would challenge us, that it would sharpen us, that it would do something on the inside of us. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Come on, fill the chat. Shout amen. Brian Kays, I'm so thankful that you're joining us today. Pastor Jim, come on, Louie. Louie, so glad that you're here. Caleb Furlong, shout out to you. Ken, so grateful that you're here. Rochelle, Susie, come on, Tara. So grateful that you're here. PT, let's go, baby. I'm glad you're tuning in. The Verb, glad that you're with us today, my guy. So grateful for all of you tuning in today and just believing that God is going to speak to us. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, tucking Journey into bed, and um, all my parents know that the bedtime routine uh, is can sometimes be crazy. Any, any parents uh, with me? Uh, you know, you're you're raising young kids, and you just worked a long day. All you stay at home moms, you've been with the kids all day. You just cook dinner. And uh, the kids are getting that extra surge of energy because they're past their bedtime by 30 minutes and they're excited and goofy and laughing and you're about to pull your hair out and you're, you got, you, you, I mean, you got this, this, this much left before you're about to lose it. KB, are you with me today? Come on. <laughs> I'm Come with you. Are you with me? And uh, we've all experienced of what it feels like to be in that moment. And if you don't have children, one day you will know what I'm talking about. Tuck this in your back pocket and shoot me a text uh, when, when you experience this. And what's so funny is your kids just find ways to continue to engage you. And on this particular night, uh, I tuck Journey in. We have this thing where she jumps into my arms, gives me a big hug. You know, we've probably read the scripture at this point and uh, got her in bed. And uh, just love to lay my hands on her head and pray over her night's rest and just really however God directs. And so th on this particular night, I prayed and uh, and then I'm getting ready to, to walk out of the room and, and I walk across the hall to go tuck my boys in. And then I hear Journey calling me back. And so I go back to the room and Journey's asking, hey, can you pray for me again? And it was for something very specific. And so uh, I shot up a quick prayer. And here's the thing. I, I felt like it was genuine, uh, but I know this, that, that uh, God doesn't judge the length of my prayers, but the weight of my prayers. And sometimes it doesn't need to be long, but it can be short and sweet. Is anybody with me? And uh, I was at the end of my rope. And so I just prayed a really short and sweet prayer. And I said, amen. And Journey said, dad, you need to go deeper and longer. <laughs> Come on. She said, you need to go deeper and longer. And uh, it's so funny because, I mean, my the prayer that I prayed, it, it was genuine. But let's be honest, because of the time of night that it was, because this is the second time that I prayed, she could sense that your boy was going through the motions. And so <laughs> it was so funny because um, I go over and I just, okay, all right, we're going to really lean in. We're going to lean in, baby. And I just started getting after it. And uh, and uh, I left the room. And it was so funny because I, I just feel like God speaks through journey a lot to me. And uh, I felt like the Holy Spirit was, was just saying, you know what, OC, this is a year where you need to go deeper and longer with me. Come on. Deeper and longer with me. With me, And in the same way that Journey was longing for her father to pray deeper and to go longer with her, I believe that um, that should be our heart posture, that that should be the yearning deep in my heart. And you see here uh, the context of the Sermon on the Mount. And as we, as we get into this, this section of scripture in chapters five through seven, we see that, man, 
I don't know about you, but when I knew it was my week to preach and I saw all red letters, I was like super stoked, number one. But number two, our team was laughing this week because we could spend the whole year preaching out of these three chapters in the book of Matthew. But I think that this Sermon on the Mount so beautifully lays out how Jesus expects his disciples to live in the kingdom of God. If we were to boil this section of scripture down to one theme, it's this, true righteousness. See, the religious leaders of that day had an artificial righteousness that was more concerned with outward behavior that was based on the law. But the righteousness that Jesus describes throughout this sermon begins internally, in the heart. The Pharisees were concerned about conduct, but Jesus was concerned with their character. And the same is true for you and I today. Jesus is more concerned about our character than our conduct. It's easy for us, right, to polish the outside of the bowl and yet have all this pollution and junk on the inside. Jesus longs for an inside out work because he wants intimacy with us. He, he, he wants connection with us. And I, I said, I'll say it like this, that Jesus is less concerned with what we're doing and more concerned with why we're doing what we're doing. So today, as we begin 21 days of prayer and fasting, I, I just want to readdress why we set aside the first part of the year to pray and fast. In this scripture today that we just read, Jesus is, is assuming that his disciples will pray and fast. And I think for some of us, if we're really honest, prayer has maybe been a, a more natural spiritual discipline than fasting. I would say that fasting, if we're honest, is a spiritual discipline that is oftentimes neglected, but it's one of the most powerful. And here's the beautiful thing. When you and I pray and fast, we're partnering with God. Come on, if you want to partner with God, put that in the chat right now. I want to partner with God in 2024. We are declaring that as we begin a new year, that we want God to be at the center of everything that we do. We are declaring through prayer and fasting that this year is going to be about God's interests, not our own. It's going to be about God's name, God's kingdom, and God's will. That This year is going to be for his glory and not our own. Can somebody say amen in the chat right now? I don't know about you, but here's what I recognize is that it's so easy to allow distraction to creep into our hearts and to begin going through the motions, similar to what I was experiencing with Journey. And I believe this, and I prophesy this over our church, that this time of prayer and fasting will awaken our body and souls to our deep hunger and need for God. When we read along in Matthew chapter 6, my favorite verse, my life verse is Matthew 6.33, and it says this, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. See, this is what this time of prayer and fasting is all about. We're saying, God, at the beginning of our year, at the first part of our year, we're going we're gonna to set aside distraction. We're going to withstand from food or from social media. And we're going to seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness and trust that all things will be added to us. If we'll do this, I believe that we'll experience a new level of faith, a new level of hope. Now, I know that there are some of you that, that you're believing God for a miracle in this season. You're, you're believing God for healing in this season. There are some of you that just, you feel like God's voice has been distant and this is going to be your opportunity to, to, to hear his still small voice. There, there are some of you right now that you're, you're praying about a transition in your career, you're praying about a transition of selling your home and moving into a next into your, the next one. And can I just tell you, church, that that praying and fasting um, is something that allows us to eliminate noise and press in to the Spirit of God. We see Daniel do this. We see G Jesus do this. Jesus would would go out to be with his Father. He would get away from all the noise 
and he would seek first his father. I believe there are some takeaways today. You guys, you guys ready? Sam, MJ, yeah. Jordan, KB, you guys, you guys ready to lean into some takeaways today, some things that we can that we can really grab onto. I think some things that the the text is is speaking to us today. You can write this first point down. The, here it is. The goal of seeking God isn't to be seen by man, but to be known by God. The goal of seeking God isn't to be seen by man, but to be known by God. This is what Jesus is coming against. He, he says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. See, it's interesting that uh, what Jesus is addressing here is, uh, you know, the, the Jewish folks would pray at nine, noon, and three. And there were certain religious individuals that were strategic, that during those hours of prayer, they would, they would walk through the most public places so that they could be seen by man, so that man would admire their spirituality. See, Jesus says this, I tell you the truth, that if this is how you and I operate, that is all the reward they will ever get. See, when you and I, when we seek out the things of God to be seen by man, that's the only reward that you and I will get. But how many of you know that when you and I seek God in the secret place, in private, we're storing up rewards in heaven? Come on, somebody. This is powerful. This is powerful. Jesus in this moment is addressing their lack of sincerity. He's describing those with insincere hearts as hypocrites. And, and some of you are even asking the question right now, well, aren't we all hypocrites? And, and here's what I want to address. A hypocrite is not someone who falls short of God's standards or sins occasionally. We all experience this level of failure. I love what Warren Wearsby says about a hypocrite. He says this, quote, a hypocrite deliberately uses religion to cover up his sins and promote his gains. What's interesting is the Greek word translated hypocrite originally meant an actor who wears a mask. An actor who wears a mask. It's so interesting because when I think about this, and uh, it just even when I was a young guy, and I'm sure those, those of you that are joining me right here on the stream, just nod your head if you can relate to this. But for me, man, I was brought to church growing up. And man, talk about feeling like an actor with a mask. That was me. I was, I was yeah. so disengaged. I was maybe physically in the church, but emotionally, spiritually, and my heart was not there at all. I was going through the motions. I was wearing a mask. And uh, I, I want to give you this quote. I'm not who, sure who said this, but write this down. If we pray to catch the ear of man, we can't expect to reach the ear of God. Oh, isn't that so good? If we pray to catch the ear of man, we can't expect to reach the ear of God. Perhaps a few questions that you and I should ask today that could help us. Here's question number one. Do I pray frequently or more fervently when I am alone with God or when I am in public with man? The second question is, is my public praying an overflow of my private prayer? See, for me, I know that this is something that as a minister and as somebody that's called to ministry, that's called to lead small a small group, that's called to show up and lead our staff, that's called to show up and engage and bring a word to a director's meeting, is I know that something's off when I'm talking more about God than I'm talking to God. Wow. That, that when I'm showing up and my I'm praying more publicly than I am in private. I know that when that's happening, something needs to shift. And um, I, I just want to tell you this, that, you know, I love playing hide and seek with my kids. Uh, I shout out to all the parents who loves playing hide and seek with their kids. It, it's so fun, especially with little kids. Um, and I, I know that there may be a few of you parents that are incredibly 
uh, um, competitive. Um, KB, um, KB, uh, um, you, you, you know, so competitive that you're like legitimately hiding and you're like, oh, my kids aren't going to find me. No way. Absolutely. They ain't finding me. Come on. Like we, if we're doing this, we're, we're playing to win. Right. KB, come on. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but, but, but there are some of us, right. We, we hide in a place where, you know, it's somewhat obvious if they're, if they're searching, they're going to find us. And here's what I want to tell us. The joy of hide and seek for the father is not in the hiding. It's in the being found. Oh, come on. The joy of hide and seek for the father is not in the hiding. It's in the being found. And I want to tell somebody today that God is not hiding from you. He's hiding for you. Deuteronomy 429 says this, but there you will seek the Lord your God. And you will find him if you seek him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. See, see, right now, I want us to understand that we seek God. The goal of seeking God is not to be seen by man, but to be known by God. And I want to bring KB on and just ask him a quick question here, because KB, something that you and I share in common, and I always laugh about this. My wife, my wife will jokingly say that, you and KB are wired the same. You're, you're like horses. You're going to just go until you drop. And uh, th there's one thing that I know is if I'm with KB, we're about to get after it. And uh, right. there's, there's only one way, right? And so it, what I want to ask you is, you know, I think that what we're, what we're realizing about Jesus and even in this section is it's not that ministering publicly or praying publicly is bad. It's not that that God isn't asking us, or is it's not that Jesus is saying we can't do that, but what he's saying is what's your motivation for doing that? And as somebody that is driven to perform and like you're a driver and, and I just think about even the journey that you're on currently, like present day, um, as you and your wife lean into reverence restored and being ministers to broken marriages all over and starting to build sort of a public platform, how, how do you really, how do you reconcile with this idea of, man, like I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to do this to be seen by man, but I want to continue to be known by God. Like how does that discipline show up? How do you fight for that posture in your heart? Yeah, such a good question. And for somebody like me who struggles with insecurity in my past has always been about what, how does man perceive me? It's this pressure to perform so that I look the way that I look and do the things that I do for man. Um, it's just a constant reminder. I know that if I get away from seeking God first, that I'm going to lose control of that battle. I can't maintain it. It's going to be, it's going to be instant, but it's not going to be consistent. And I'm looking for consistency. I want to finish this thing strong. So every time that I have one of those moments where I start thinking about money in the bank or, Oh, we're so sweet. It's like, no, I've got to get back to saying, okay, how do we do this God's way? And how do we align with what God wants us to do? Because if I'm not seeking him first, I'm going to lose this battle really quickly and I'm going to face burnout and we want to win for the long haul, not just short term. It's so good. And I love that you're sharing this. And I think, you know, some people might think that, oh, okay, yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm, I'm seeking God first. I'm showing up to church on Sundays and, and, uh, and I, and I, and I come to a group, but I want to go just a layer deeper because, you know, we, and we're going to get into it here, but you know, that, that man, daily intimacy with God is something that, man, we're, we're trying to really get help Christians all over the earth understand that, man, this is God's heart, that, that he wants you to be a self feeder, that he wants you to, you know, get in your word daily and pray. And so practically speaking, like, what does that look like for you every single day? Yeah. My morning time is the morning time for me to really get right with the Lord. And it, that, that continues throughout, right? So I take that moment for that first half hour, 45 minutes, 10 minutes, whatever I have in the morning, but I try to set aside specific time, intentional time to sit with the Lord and hear what he has in store for us, for me, for my family, the leader that he's calling me to be, the husband that he's calling me to be. And I want to hear from him specifically. So taking that to prayer, first really sitting with him, reading the word, getting into the daily reading, and then taking it upon my day to go out and apply those things. And then it's the small group, man, where I fall short. I just jump back into my small group, um, 
share that with my guys, my, my close group of guys that are going to come alongside me where I'm weak, where I'm stumbling and allow them to just help raise me up in those moments. It's so good, man. And, and I love that you, you called out that component because it's true. It's like, we, 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 we get in community to create a safe space, to, to have built in accountability, but also to be stirred on, to, to spur, be spurred on. There's, you know, there's something, isn't there something special? Like, man, when you see that you're, buddy to the right and your buddy to the left is on fire and pressing in doesn't it just it propels you forward and yeah. that's what we're created for and so thanks for sharing that man and uh just grateful um grateful for your pursuit and the way that you're leading your family in that way continue to lean in and steward that uh, again number one the goal of seeking god isn't to be seen by man but to be known by god and number two here write it down when you pray and fast in private god will reward you in public when you pray and fast in private, God will reward you in public. Another way to say it is when you seek God in private, he will reward you in public. In verse six, he says, but when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. And there's one translation that says he will reward you openly. This is where we see God honors those of us publicly that are pursuing him privately. And I want to share more about why I think that's the case. In verse 17, he says, but when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face, then no one will notice that you are fasting except your father who knows what you do in private. So pro tip right here, those of you that are starting your fast today, do not go into work tomorrow with a limp with a look on your face, just waiting for Johnny in the cubicle to be like, what's going on with you, Abe? And you're like, oh, man, I'm fasting. So spiritual. So spiritual, aren't I? Uh, we're not going to spiritually flex, man. We're As a matter of fact, Jesus is saying, yo, comb your hair, wash your face, walk around as if you're not even fasting. Don't do it for attention from man, but do it for affection with me. Jesus reveals in this moment that one of the real secrets of prayer and fasting is secret prayer and fasting. Write this down and fill it in the chat. You guys know I love to say this. Say it with me if you know it. The secret place is the secret sauce. Come on, the secret place is the secret sauce or the secret sauce is the secret place. One translation says this, go into your room. Now, the ancient Greek word used for room meant a storeroom where treasures were kept. I want you to catch this. One translation says, go into your room. The ancient Greek word used for room meant a storeroom where treasures were kept. I want to remind somebody today on this stream that treasures are waiting for you and I in the secret place. Come on, is anybody thankful for that right now? Is anybody thankful that it's in the secret place where God has treasure for you and I? I wrote this down in my notes, and I believe that this is for somebody. Somebody needs to get this in their spirit today. And here it is. Here's the quote. This year's success won't be measured by how high you go, but by how close you get. Let me say that again. This year's success won't be measured by how high you go, but by how close you get. Why does God want us to get close? Because proximity builds intimacy. Proximity builds intimacy. It's in private where our character is developed. Character is developed in private. I remember in 2012, I was trying to do great things for God. God, I want to play in the NFL to bring you glory. I was trying to do great things for God, but he wanted to do great things in me. So what did he do? He ended the dream, took me to California in the wilderness where I knew nobody. He wanted me to live Matthew 6, he wanted me to get into the secret place, into the wilderness so that I could get in proximity to his presence and begin learning what it looks like to be intimate with my heavenly father. This year, let's be a people that yearn for connection, not clout. 
So many people in our culture today are pursuing clout. It's all about influence and being known, and yet they're missing out on the very thing that's going to sustain them for the long haul. It's connection with Jesus and Jesus alone. If you and I chase clout, we're only going to get it for a moment. We're never going to sustain it because we weren't being developed in private. I love what 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, and Miss Denise shared this verse uh, on our call this morning in tip time as we were praying for you all. And here's what this verse says. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. This is good news, MJ. This is real good news. And I want to talk to you because one of the things that I love about you, one of the reasons why I'm so grateful for our friendship is um, because you're one of the most disciplined, consistent men that I know. And and here, here's what I want to tell you. Like, it's not just spiritually, but in all areas of your life. And here's what I love is that like your bottom floor at your house is a gym. And my guy loves arms. He loves arms work. I mean, look at him. Just throw him up real quick. Just real <laughs> quick, MJ. Just give, give him a, I mean, my goodness. Are you kidding me? The only way that that comes to fruition is through consistency. But here's the beautiful thing is you're, you're, in, you're in your weight room alone. You're in private. You're not going to a public place. Like you're doing that where, where you're accountable to nobody but God. And the same is true is each and every morning you come and you sit in that same spot and you, you journal. And oftentimes I'm getting those text messages. And so for you, like, how have you seen this public or excuse me, this private discipline translate into your public ministry and like actually being able to minister out of overflow and be secure because God's speaking to you in the, in the private. I think you nailed it, Mike. It was uh, being secure. Me being here, it literally in this spot, my desk has been here for the past, gosh, four years. This, this private intimate time with the Lord, or even as I'm praying downstairs, when I'm lifting by myself has given me that like, like that confidence that I don't need to have the perfect prayer. I don't need to have the perfect word for somebody to pray for them. I just pray, okay, Lord, is this what you're telling me to do? And then obey without this time. I don't know if I would have that. I would still be uh, very fearful or my identity wouldn't be as secure as it is to just go out and do, just send that text, speak that word. And so I think that's the deal is it's given me a lot of confidence and my, my identity is all about him. Nobody else. It's so good because one of my one of the things that I love about you is you're not just disciplined at pursuing God for what you can get from God, but how how God can then deposit something in you and then you can give it away. And and you would probably agree with this that it's in those quiet moments that you're able to number 1 hear his voice and his encouragement to you, but number 2 uh, hear from him on who he wants you to encourage, who who he wants you to reach out to. I know that that's a that's another discipline for you. Can you speak into that? Yeah, it's it's a um, uh, PT, and I discussed this last week as well. It's it's in those moments that I literally will say, Lord, I have a section in my journal, Mike. It's about that big. Who do I pray for today, Lord? Who who needs some encouragement? Who do I know? Just give me a name, give me a couple names, and it never comes back. Well, like I, as I'm praying or reading the word that person always comes to mind. And I think it's it, in his time, it's always the right time. He's always on time every time. It's not me. I'm just asking. I'm just asking him, guide me. And it's the word, uh, the, the people just come to mind. Similar to you as you traveled this week. I'm like, you know what? I wonder if Mike needs some help in this area because he's gone and Jarek is at home with the kids. His driveway <laughs> might need a little help. That was, I was- things, Mike. Yeah, I was practical. Prayer, prayer leads to practical. It really does, and I was so blown away by that. And it's it, it's funny just to bring context. And you know, there 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 are, there are certain moments where, as ministers, it's like you know, we 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 also recognize that you know we can't share every story because we don't want to lose our reward in heaven. But at the same time, we want to spur the community on, and it's true. Like I'm I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, away from my family. Y'all are getting like 15 inches of snow this week. 
And I was blown away when you reached out and said, Hey man, like who's plowing your drive? How can, how can we, how can I help out with that? I mean, that, that's what's so cool is we get to be a part of building God's kingdom to be used of him um, in powerful ways when we're hearing from him in the secret place. The secret place is the secret sauce. The glory is for him and him alone, right, MJ? Thanks, thanks, man. Love, love, uh, love your thoughts on that. Uh, number one, number one, if you're if you're tracking with me today, number one, we said it. The goal of seeking God isn't to be seen by man, but to be known by God. Number two, when you pray, uh, when you seek God in private, God will reward you in public. And number three, write it down. We seek God like we're sons and daughters. And this is what we're going to finish with today. We seek God like we're sons and daughters. Now, I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, there's, a, there's a phrase that sometimes we can, we can say, and, and there's truth to it. Uh, I'm just a, a sinner saved by grace. That's true. That's true, but but before before Christ, uh, you were stuck in your sin. You were dead in your sin. The Bible says, and uh, but here's what we know is that Jesus shed His blood so that you and I could be sons and daughters of God, sons and daughters of the Most High King. And I love Pastor Todd taught it last week that that when Jesus was baptized, before he did any of his public ministry, what did God the Father say to God the Son? He said, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Before Jesus did anything, God was reassuring his Son of his deep identity. And for those of us that are in Christ, this is how God the Father sees you and I. He sees us as sons and daughters. Now, I've been thinking about this a lot because if you identify with being a sinner, not a son, it's no wonder that you find yourself drifting towards isolation from a holy God. Come on, somebody. Only sons, only those that know who they are, that know they've been bought at a high price, that it wasn't their own good works, it wasn't their earning or their yearning, but it was God's grace poured out. That's what gives them access now. That causes us, that mindset, that shift causes us to now come boldly before the throne of grace. I, I heard uh, it said this, that there's no evidence of anyone before Jesus using the, this term to address God. In other words, uh, the Jewish people would not refer to God as their father because it was, it was too intimate. You know, it is true that God is the mighty sovereign uh, God who created the universe, who governs it, and who will judge all all things, but I want to declare to somebody today, he is also your father. I want you to know that you can get intimate with God during this 21 days of prayer and fasting, and maybe you've never been able to identify with God as your, as your father because you had a difficult relationship with your earthly father, and you can't help but take your earthly father's face and place it on the heavenly father. You know, I'm talking about the father that said he was going to be there, but he wasn't. The father that walked out on you, the, the father that maybe physically abused you. Here's what I want to declare today. That is not who your heavenly father is. Your heavenly father loves you. Your heavenly father wants to sit with you. Your heavenly father wants to uh, uh, walk with you. Your heavenly father wants to lead you and guide you. And, and I wrote this down in my notes. We understand that the perception we have of ourselves will determine how we live our lives. Listen to this quote by the late Dr. Adrian Rogers. He said this, the me I see is the me I, I'll be. Let me say that again. The me I see is the me I'll be. Take a moment right now and write that statement in in your journal 
The me I see is the me I be that I'll be. We, we can't view ourselves as sinners. We need to see ourselves as sons and daughters. This is going to cause us to press in. I kept getting a picture of, of the lepers back in the day, right? They were casted out. There was a level of shame associated to their disease. And I think that this is what does when we, when we come under the weight of identifying as a sinner, this weight drives us away from drawing close to our Heavenly Father. We talked about this in our small group, MJ, just a few weeks ago. And, and Sam, you were in the room as well. Many of the guys in our group were talking about how, man, when they make these mistakes, like how do they decipher through guilt and shame and conviction? Well, what we said was conviction draws us towards God the Father. Shame and guilt drives us away. And I think so much of this revelation of sonship determines how we pray and fast, how we actually walk out these spiritual disciplines. And I think that you have a lot of insight to offer here on just this revelation. I know you oftentimes are speaking true identity over the men in our group. So as you think about this concept, like, how does this hit you in your heart and, and how, and how valuable and important has the revelation of sonship been in your pursuit of Jesus? Yeah, man, that is such a powerful word. And I think it's probably been the biggest game changer in my life. Uh, many of you don't know, but I have a background of, of being a, a drug addict, an absolute slave to sin, uh, different kinds of sin, but drug addiction and uh, pornography addiction. And I'm telling you, there was a time in my life where I just walked around saying, I'm just an addict. I used to go, you know, and, and say, Hey, I'm, I used to introduce myself. Hey, I'm Sam and I'm an addict. I'd be at different meetings that are trying to, I'm trying to get help, but that was my identity. And so I kept screwing up and I kept saying, after all, that's just who I am. I'm just an addict. So, you know, nobody's surprised by that. But when God took me through a process, getting a hold of my heart, and he showed me the way that he saw me as his son, that even before I, I've done anything, you know, really all I was bringing to the table was this mess. And he says, yep, I'll take that. And I just love you. And uh, you are my son. And as I really began to receive that as my identity, then there, there are times I've screwed up since going through a whole process with the Lord. I went through, you know, a Christian discipleship ministry uh, for over a year trying to get free from addiction. And even after I got out, I screwed up again. I got high again and, and went back to the drugs. But something was so different in the past that was, well, this is just me. I'm just an addict. So what do you expect? But that time that I was, I was stumbling back into some things, but it was so clear. I was like, what am I doing this isn't who I am. Come God's on. told me who I am. I'm a son. This, like this just isn't for me. God so has good. so much more for me. And there was something very, very different about that experience for me. And honestly, the, the, the power that drug addiction and other sin had had in my life evaporated. Um, and it, it was all around this, this understanding of my identity and, and how God sees me as his son. Come on, for anybody who is in Christ Jesus, Sam, is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. He's given us a new nature, a new name, a new identity. Man, I'm so inspired by your story. And I know that many others right now uh, are inspired as well, man. Thanks for sharing that. So good, man, that as we, as we seek God, let's seek him like we're sons and daughters. Reminder, the goal of seeking God isn't to be seen by man, but to be known by God. When you seek God in private, God will reward you in public. And when we seek God during these 21 days of prayer and fasting, would we seek him like we're sons and daughters? Would we cross over into proximity, into intimacy? Why are you seeking God? Why am I seeking God? It's not to be seen by man. It's to be known by God. I was leaving to go to Phoenix this week and I was rushing out the, the door and I was like, do I have time to eat a bowl of cereal? No, I don't, but I'm hungry and I'm about to get on this flight. So I'm pouring this cereal uh, a bowl and I'm going to take it with me. And I don't recommend eating cereal while you're driving. Um, so I'm not giving that advice right now, but I had to, I had to hurry up and get out. And I, and there were these chocolate cocoa crispies, gluten-free 
uh, cereal. I mean, it's just absolute bomb, MJ. Come on. You're, I know you're a cereal guy. And so as I'm walking out the door, uh, Royce catches a glance that I'm eating the cereal. And he kind of looks at me cross-eyed like, wait a second. We've got Cocoa Krispies in this house. Like, Dad, where are those at? And I'm trying to rush out and I've got to get going to catch this flight. And Royce is like, dad, I want some cereal. And I'm like, I love it. Tell your mama when she wakes up, she'll get you a bowl. And he looks at me and he's like, no, I can do it. And I'm like, oh boy, I don't have time to debate with you right now, but you're four years old. You, you've, oh, you, I've never seen you pour your own milk and pour your own cereal. I had this thought. I'm like, he's got to learn at some point. He's got to figure it out at some point. He's got to start somewhere. Does it really matter if some Cocoa Krispies end up on my kitchen floor or some milk all over the counter? No, it doesn't. Because he's crossing over from saying, dad, serve me, dad, feed me to, I want to participate. I want to do this thing. And I believe that in this season, in this moment, in this hour, you've been showing up to church Maybe you've been even showing up to a group and you've been you've been receiving a lot and you've been fed a lot. But this is an opportunity in this season to say, man, I'm going to start self-feeding. I'm going to cross over. I'm, I'm going it, to it, it's over from moving from being fed a bottle to man. I'm going to pursue God. I'm going to lean in for myself. I'm going to be like Royce and say it's time. The time is now. And I believe that God is inviting us into something special in this season. Why are you seeking God? Why am I seeking God? God wants to know us deeper. God wants to give us peace. God wants to be high and lifted up. And would we be a church that puts him at the center of everything? Come on, if you're ready to seek God in the beginning of this year and you're ready to put him first, you're ready to lean into every single thing that he has for you this year. I want you right now in the chat to say, I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. Just fill up the chat right now. Let's fill it up. Let's make the declaration right now on the internet that Jesus, we are going to pursue you with our whole hearts, that we're going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things will be added to us. Come on, if you want that right now, just say, I'm in. And I believe that God is going to be, I'm seeing it right now. Tommy, come on. God bless you. Brittany, God bless you. Pat. God bless you, Austin. God bless you, Terry. Come on, I love that you're in. Bailey, let's go. Rick, Tamara, Corey, Josiah, Justin, fill it up. Come on, just fill it up. Grab your phone, say, I'm in. Come on, this is your active response. We're not just doing this to be seen. We're saying, God, I'm in. Ariel, come on. Michael, I'm in. Cindy, I'm in. Matt Jackson, I'm in. Terry, I'm in. I love the response today. I love seeing you guys say yes. Jesse, come on. Michael, let's go. Christian, let's go. Beautiful. Father, we come to you and we just say thank you right now for every single person that's saying they're in, that, that they want to seek you with their whole hearts, that they want to put you first, that they want to have proper priorities this year. And I pray that even as we begin this fast, as we go into these 21 days where we set aside time, to hear from heaven, to create space, to draw near. Lord, we know that your word declares that as we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. And we can't wait to receive what you have, God. We're just grateful and we're thankful for all that you're doing.